Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies is a non-for-profit independent institution, a think tank established in '69 by a former um, Danish finance minister and the first general secretary of OECD, Torke Christensen. And when he came back to Denmark in '68, he wanted an independent think tank that looked more at the future in order to prepare decision making. And the way we we work is is that we use. Uh, you know, it doesn't change slides. Why doesn't it do that? Oh. Yeah, the way we, we work is uh, is to use megatrends as a filter. So for instance, we won't go through all of them, but, uh, but there is, for instance, demographic development and, and focus on health, polarization. And, and the, the, the really interesting thing with using lenses like this is not to look linearly, but to see what happens when, when these things collide in different ways. So we are, as we also have heard uh, before in the morning, we are uh, having technology expanding rapidly, but there is also a, a sense of that we are not utilizing, we are not able to use it as well as we should. And here it also helps to think about technical and adaptive change because it looks like we are very much working with new technology, but in the old system, we are not changing and adapting the paradigm to it. And this is where we also are trying to, to discuss and, and help with saying, okay, when are we improving something and when are we actually doing something that's totally new? And, and that's where we are in the beginning of a paradigm shift and, and maybe one of the reasons why it's so hard to go faster forward. But there is a very important thing here is, is that the COVID crisis has showed us, yes, there has been some collaboration. Yes, there has been some speedy processes of, of getting technology out to use, but the countries returned back to the old city states. The cross-border collaboration did not increase as we had hoped and expected would happen in, in, in a situation like this. Last year, we ran a big uh, process with the five Nordic countries on, on aligning on health, which rests on a, a prime minister decision on, uh, on having the Nordics as the most integrated region in the world by 2030. And we have taken the lead on realizing that on the health area. But also, we saw that we needed to go beyond politics. And going back to my comment before that we are going back to, to city states, this was something we could already see that health parts are so embedded in, in the national politics, even if we rationally know that we need to work cross border. And this comes back to what are our big challenges? Yes, right now, COVID is a huge challenge for everybody, but both before and after we have some long term issues with an increased disease burden in, in a person's lifespan, uh, an end of life solution, uh, and focus on uh, on disease. So, so what does this mean? This means that um, we're having the same input of resources in the society, but we need to produce uh, more health services. There is something wrong with how we're gonna, or it doesn't fit up how we're gonna finance this part. And we can also show it in, in just in this way with chronic diseases. We have known for thousands of years that we need to try to keep the healthy healthy but we only begin to pay when we are up here then where people are ill and it's hard to return to the original state. And we can also say that when we do uh, uh, innovation and, and go to market, the biggest premium is here. So we, are, uh, we have a premium for late intervention uh, and no money for prevention. So that also makes our focus go more in, in, in that way. And of course, as we also have heard uh, before, real world data and real world evidence is really important in this. What we are trying to push together in going forward is then an evidence-based care for one and precision public health. So it's a lot about being better with evidence and knowing what we do also. So, so it's not just about doing the right things or doing things right, but doing the right things right, which is quite difficult to, to get together and why it's very important to work together. So what is, what is the aim when we go forward? The aim is best possible quality of life and well-being during the lifespan. The technology which we are talking about and, and we appraise and we see can help us is a mean to this end. And that's very important to get into the big picture. Often we tend to have the biggest focus on the tech itself. 
and, and not on, on the goal. In health, we also see uh, new big players coming fast in. These, just mentioning these four, which are called the four big horsemen from the East and West. They come in with new business model. They come in with out of clinical healthcare, but health relevant data and solutions. And that will probably also change the way we can work and with which players we will work in the future. We already have some examples. But also when we look at how, how massively they are investing in, in, uh, in the area of health and well-being, uh, they're not doing that for fun. So, so that will be a part of it. We will also see new payers. So insurance companies and pension funds might come into it. Some of the technology that we have seems to need a lifespan approach in order to, to pay off. And if we only have year by year budgets or, or four or five years political cycles, it doesn't really work. So we need to, to think cradle to grave. And here, new business model and probably also new payers might, uh, might help on, on that part. So back to the core uh, in this, in the, in the European system, uh, there are some research infrastructures and, and some of them very relevant for, for life science and health have worked in this, uh, in this uh, coalition called uh, Corbel uh, for some years. And uh, at least the first phase, I don't know if it's continuing. I don't think it looks like that. But the first phase had uh, these uh, research infrastructures involved. And it's important to, to get a grasp of um, uh, how vast the area is. Because what happens with, with now is that we have hyper-specialization, but we need to have it in a holistic approach. So we need to get this very, very deep knowledge on areas, but put into an integrated uh, care approach and integrated understanding approach, which, which of course is very hard and is hard for everybody to, to get to fit together. So we have, for instance, the, the BBMRI on, on biobanking, uh, the ATRIS on, on translational medicine, ACRIN on uh, uh, clinical research infrastructures uh, network, um, uh, Elixir does it. It uh, does a lot of uh, having a, available resources for for uh, researchers uh, and quality control. Um, the Marine Bio Biology Resource Center, which which also has a focus on therapeutics, cosmetics, nutrition uh, in the aquacultures and and fishery products. Uh, Emphasis, which uh, which does this multi scale plant phenotyping, which which also is important for us here. Uh, Irinia, which is the infrastructure on highly pathogenic agents, which I guess is, is very important for us. Uh, the open screen on, on platforms for, for chemical biology uh, in the research infrastructures. Uh, the Eurobio imaging uh, uh, on, on to get the imaging part in as well, and uh, the infra frontier on, um, on developing phenotypic uh, uh, phenotypic parts on, on the mammalian models and they are servicing with a lot of mice models in it uh, and, in, and instruct with the integrated uh, structural uh, biological infrastructure. Uh, ISPE with the infrastructure for system biology and, and MIRRI with, uh, with the microbial resource, uh, resource research infrastructure. So bringing all of this highly, highly specialized things together in a group and, and, and work cross-disciplinary, but also cross-border is extremely important. And, and this is the basis of going forward with uh, precision medicine, personalized health and, and precision, uh, precision public health. We need to have these things working together and, and have the basic science, science uh, in, in order. And here we can just mention that um, even if Europe has pushed this together, we have also uh, seen that the COVID response on, on economy has cost a lot of the budget uh, for several of these infrastructures. So, so that is also something to, to think about. But this takes us also to, to another point of, um, of on the molecular bi biology, the, the genomics is, is um, um, the one that has been most developed. And it might be down to a thousand dollars for full genome sequence in, a, in in three, four, five years. But there are also several companies working on doing the same with the behavioral, all the behavioral and environmental data for a person. So just imagine when you can, when you can merge these two data sets for two hundred dollars, the, the the vast opportunity space that you will that you will get with this. But it also requires that what we put in 
is, is validated uh, and can be used. Uh, and this is also where, where we need to have um, a focus on and understand why the infrastructures are so important. What also has been brought forward in, in this long push in European uh, research on, on the life science areas is the FAIR principle on, on definable, accessible, interoperable and reusable uh, data. And it's extremely important that we keep on understanding that data needs to be reused. That's where it, where it really has its value. We have um, been very involved in another project called Future Proofing Healthcare, which is more on aggregated data for decision making, for instance, for politicians and administrative staff in order to move forward. Based on that, uh, we, 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 we have this uh, understanding that a lot of decisions are based on emotions and not facts, but it's very hard to get access to aggregated data on how does health look in both in your own country, but also also in Europe. So, so the part here is to to assemble data and make it easier use easier usable for decision makers. So, as said here, making data and insights more accessible, building broad coalitions for change based on data and knowledge, and enabling leadership for change. Or to say it very bluntly, to provide the data sources so you can have data driven health. Coming back to the Nordic Health 2030 uh, from last year uh, that we worked with, we developed a lot of different concepts. We also learned that we can't build a long lasting um, collaboration uh, across several countries on technology. It needs to have some basic values. And these are the Nordic values that we, that we ended up with. And the values will be different depending on where you are in the world, of course. But one of the basic conclusion was uh, the 5-5 aspiration or the 50-50, as we call it, uh, outside of the, of the Nordics. So in the Nordics, the country used more or less 10% of the GDP on health, uh, mainly the public uh, unified payer on it. So, so the idea and, and the conclusion here was saying, okay, by 2030, that should be divided. So it's half of it is, is pure curative and half of it is, is based on the prevention idea being promotion uh, and primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So it's not taking everything out of the hospital, that's not the point, but putting in the vision and, and, and the paradigm of, of prevention much more central. And then another principle which mainly comes out of, of uh, my, all my, my good work, uh, my good relations and, and, and very interesting work with, uh, with the Bulgarian uh, partners, uh, is this 1090 principle, because we also see that high-end technology tends to, to just be towards the richest 10% in the world. And why is that? So we are also beginning to ask if technology is so good, why can't we use it for the other 90% where the impact actually is much bigger, where the need is much bigger? So let us try to focus on democratizing um, um, the access and the use of technology to, to a much wider audience. And then there is also the 80-20 the principle on saying that if we can normally, when we look at least in the OECD countries, we have a need for, for health services for around 20% of the population. But then what, why don't we focus on using technology to keep these 80% healthy as long as possible? Uh, and then we have more resources to help the 20% who need it more and better. That should be a, a, a win for all. We can also see that going forward, health uh, is much more than disease. It's about health and, and life navigation. And in that part, we need a lot of data. Uh, and transparency here will be key. So, so consent and transparency, traceability and accountability are going to be key on how we're going to work with individuals and, and, and institutions and countries at the same time. To lock everything in in cyber secured Fort Knox will not help because then we can't share and use data. That's not the solution. Uh, and, and we need then more to work with how, how can we have a traceability that, that then is the accountability and, and, and the security in it. It probably also requires uh, a different kind of responsibility. So a corporate responsibility where companies come in and work uh, with the systems or in the systems and take in responsibility in developing countries. Um, so normally uh, uh, private public partnerships are flagged, but in reality, they're just uh, service contracts where, where a company provides a service to, to, uh, to a political entity. Um, we, we need the political responsibility in having in enabling law frames and not prohibiting law frames. We need the same from the administrative part on responsibility. 
and of course also in the in the civil society. So, what this really led to in the uh, in the in the Nordic setting was develop development of this uh, human on concept where where the person actually is in the center because we envisage that if we go forward uh, push forward for precision medicine for personalized health. We need to, uh, to invest it much more into the individual person. It will be much more cross-border because we will work firstly uh, on, or also with rare diseases, but a lot of diseases, diseases will be stratified so much that it will look a bit like rare diseases. And then it's very important to have enough, uh, the volume of, uh, of people to work with. So, so here we, we, we need to, to be quite clear on the biology uh, have the behavioral part, environmental factors and the societal factors. Uh, and when we talk about the, the infrastructures, they are, of course, uh, these that were mentioned very much based on, on, on the part on the biology, but they also have a lot of knowledge on how to work and can build uh, structures for how, for instance, to, to work with the behavioral data that we can get in and also to map, map the environmental uh, factors and, and social factors. But important here is, is also that we need to get in some cornerstones, as I mentioned before, with transparency, traceability and accountability, but also to have interoperable systems. So not discussing about which system, but they should be interoperable. For instance, as uh, Estonia and, uh, um, and Finland have done with this extra philosophy that everything that comes in has to be interoperable and there is no lock in on the data so so it can can be used uh, and and also that is the opening for the secondary use and uh, and also with uh, with data sharing how how do we do that so going forward um this uh, this leads us then to a a sustainable health model where, where we need to think about in the beginning that this is about providing health for an individual person, but we also need a public health system that works. But if we really want to have prevention a prevention regime in it, we actually need to, to deliver usable data, validated usable data back to the individual so they can change their behavior so it works better. And, and we need the individual to deliver back to, to the aggregated so we can refine and understand the, the picture better and also have the public health picture on it. So that requires not that the individual can get some data assistance when they're ill or almost dying, but you actually can get it in a, in a real time loop. That, and that is a totally different way of working and requires much more. Uh, but probably can can also help with with the making um, making data and 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 the knowledge that we have about the disease and health usable. And I must say that we we would also probably need to be begin to focus much more on on that health is not primarily about disease, but it's actually about also understanding health and, and keeping uh, people healthy. Um, there are several challenges before we come to that part. So, so three normal protection that we have gotten used to, uh, at least uh, as being stated uh, in, in human rights is protections from the state, from organization and from criminals. And, and in this part of when we ask people to share data, we, we need to be able to, to protect them. So this cannot haunt them back in a negative way at any time in the future. And that discussion is not really present. That's something that we, that we really, really need. And we can say that maybe it sounds a lot like a, a, um, a theoretical discussion, hypothetical discussion, but today we have huge discussions on, should we have biological passport and, and have, uh, uh, apps that trace uh, traces your whereabouts to it as well in order for you to to uh, enter countries or enter airplanes or maybe enter meetings in in the future so there are some of these issues that we would need to discuss and the basic science of a lot of these things we would still benefit a lot from having very dynamic infrastructures working with it so um before I, I end this, I would also have a plea to you that in order to go forward, in order to work, and it's very important for me also, and this is why I, I also enjoy working um, with the Bulgarian ecosystem, 
is is that this is this is a global endeavor. We need to work uh, globally with this. This is not just uh, some pockets uh, in countries or some pocket of countries. So please collaborate as policymakers for for humanity. Ask what you can do towards 2030 and 2050, but definitely also what you can do tomorrow. And also just ask the what if question. Health becomes a permanent part of everybody's life, not just when the disease comes knocking. Care will be person-centric. Prevention or health management will gain much more significant, uh, much more significant role. Uh, so how can you facilitate that change, meet those needs and develop a model that serves that purpose? And here, uh, I'm quite certain that this will you will realize here how important research infrastructures are for this basic part. Uh, and I will just end by saying that um, on October 6, we will have a satellite meeting for the biotech at the year with, uh, with these um, research infrastructures that were mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Bogi. This was, as usually an extremely impressive presentation, and I am really happy that we worked together. Before giving the passing the word to Dr. Simichiev, who will chair the next session, I have one question for you. Uh, we have been discussing several times um, how we can bring closer east and west and south and uh, north together. Do you think that the zeitgeist, the COVID, is um, blocking those developments or uh, it's giving more chance? What's your perception? Yes, um, I, I think uh, what it has realized for me, and this is the question I'm asking everybody where I go now, the countries are not going to deliver the cross border. So the countries are not going to help us do that as we thought a year ago. It's going to be the actors. It's going to be the biotech atelier. It's going to be the puppet. It's going to be the companies. Uh, it's going to be the researchers in the infrastructures. I do think that uh, once the biggest pressure is off, people will, will get their logic back and they will understand that working with pandemics cannot be done country by country. Uh, and, and, and do we get there? It depends very much if, if the people who attend this conference, if the people like us uh, have enough energy to make a new way of working together. But if you ask me if I think that the state leaders will do it, my answer is no. They have failed badly. Yes. And uh, what will be the role of artificial intelligence for bringing uh, closer north and south and east and west? Yeah, I, I think that will be key because uh, uh, in, in a certain way, it, it means that uh, that the east can leapfrog some of the things which, which the west has used a lot of years to build up. Uh, and and there are parts and and, uh, and parts of also Bulgaria, but also other countries are quite strong on the IT, IT side. So so I do think that that is one one of the one of the fast roads, fast tracks to to go forward. Thank you, Bogi.